1880s to about 1920s went from 100 million to 50 million acres pretty quickly. Uh, second cause of decline for prairie dogs and subsequently ferrets are large scale poisoning programs aimed at um, reducing populations of prairie dogs to increase forage for cattle um, and just less tolerance in general. Um, a lot of these were government sponsored. Poisoning alone um, kind of took that scale of prairie dogs from 50 million acres down to less than a million acres over time. And everything from strychnine to compound 80 to zinc phosphide and more recently anticoagulants have been kind of favored choices. And we still use zinc phosphide a lot today for control where prairie dogs are undesirable. The third factor that really um, helped reduce the distributional range of black-footed ferrets um, tied to that of prairie dogs, of course, is sylvatic plague. It's a non-native disease um, spread by a bacterium, Yersinia pestis. It's carried by fleas. Prairie dogs can die by being bitten by an infected flea, and then because they're a communal species, they can die from interacting with each other. Ferrets can die from also being bitten by an infected flea or by eating an infected prairie dog or surely by starvation because all the prairie dogs are gone. Um, it's an introduced disease, non-native, came in to San Francisco Harbor on ships um, that rats were hanging out with fleas hanging onto them. And so once the fleas jumped off the rats into San Francisco Harbor, it started moving from the western part of the United States into the Great Plains. Um, and it's carried by any kind of small mammal host. Um, we don't really know a lot about plague other than it's highly lethal to both prey dogs and ferrets. And we still really struggle with managing it today and I'm going to talk a lot about it. So this is a really um, rough schematic of what we believe happened over time. This is the approximate distribution of prey dog colonies. We call colony complexes a series of prey dogs connected together by no more than a mile apart. Those complexes looked about like this, we're guessing 100 million acres, occupied in the 1850s. Then you start adding some European settlement, um, some more agriculture coming in, plowing up of the prairie. You start adding plague coming in from the western part of the US, also contributing to the losses of this prairie dog habitat. You start throwing in some poison, more poison, different kinds of poison, <laughs> lots of poison, and by the late 90s, we're looking at less than 2% uh, of the historical range of prairie dogs occupying the Great Plains. So that had a large impact on the presence of ferrets. So again, we went from 100 million acres to less than a million acres occupied by prairie dogs. And again, this had such drastic effects on the populations of black-footed ferrets that we believe that they were extinct. Um, pretty much by 1987, um, or even before, in the, in the early 60s, we didn't think there were ferrets out there at all. So there were a lot of campaigns by the Fish and Wildlife Service um, and Wyoming Game and Fish Department to figure out, you know, are there any left? If anyone sees them, please let us know. Because they really thought the ferret was extinct. Um, but through this um, stroke of luck, a small population was discovered here in South Dakota, of course, since the Holy Grail for a lot of the initial fair recovery efforts. Um, Millette County, this population once held about 90 ferrets, which is a, a pretty substantial size. Um, it became the source of wh what we have learned about ferrets in the early, early days because they're elusive nocturnal species. It's hard to study them. So this population was pretty popular. By the late 1960s, they were listed as endangered. Um, they took a handful of ferrets into captivity to try to save the species from extinction. Those efforts failed because we really didn't know much about ferrets, we didn't know much about captive breeding. So sadly that really failed heavily and then by 1979 we again thought ferrets were extinct because the last population, last ferret in this population died, we think probably from canine distemper or plague, but no one really knows. Then, thanks to a dog named Shep, um, he brought a ferret into his owners um, one day in Matitsi, Wyoming. And the owners were like, sweet, what is this thing? Let's go get it stuffed. And they took it to their taxidermist. And the taxidermist was like, whoa, whoa, I saw that poster. That's an endangered black bear ferret. So that led to this like huge invasion of biologists on this poor ranching town of Matitsi, Wyoming. If any of you have ever been there, it's a really cool, beautiful area, kind of this intermountain west um, grassland habitat. And they, um, there are about 150 
ferrets there, those pretty nice populations. Ferret, ferrets were pretty popular. We did a lot more studies over there. And again, we had some disease coming in. Canine distemper, plague, started wiping out the population. Biologists trapped up their last remaining ferrets, which were about 24, they think. That population died again. And um, of the 24 that were captured, 15 were contributor breeders, which represented pretty much only seven genetic founders. And those seven genetic founders, thanks to captive breeding efforts, were um, are the foundation for all ferrets that are bred in captivity and released in the wild today. So it's a pretty crazy feat, pretty impressive. Um, right now, there are five zoos and one federal facility that breed ferrets in captivity to promote the species survival and prevent extinction from occurring. Um, by 1991, there were enough ferrets captured or produced in captivity for reintroductions. And thanks to reintroductions, that's why we even have ferrets in the wild today. Um, they have there are about 28 release sites since 1991 where ferrets have been reintroduced. Some have been successful, some not. Of those 28, about 20 actually have ferrets alive on them today for various reasons. Plague is a big portion of that, um, and I'll go into that a little bit later. Um, but really, if we are going to achieve recovery, we need to put ferrets in many, many more places than we have today, even though 28 sounds like a lot. Those 28 uh, reintroduction sites occupy less than 100,000 acres of habitat. It's pretty crazy. So you went from like 100 million acres of prairie dog habitat where ferrets were um, thriving to less than, you know, 100,000 acres. It's pretty, pretty grim. So our target's about 500,000 acres of habitat for ferrets. Um, these little squares and, or triangles and dots just represent areas where we could potentially put them if socially and politically it's okay. Um, the, the recovery goals call for 3,000 breeding adults in 30 populations spread across the nine states and Canadian provinces of Saskatchewan. Um, we'd like to see at least 30 breeding adults in each of those populations, and 10 of those populations need to have at least 100 breeding adults for survival of the species. And we, we have some qualifications that some of those populations need to occur in the black tail range, some of them need to occur in the white tail range, and some of them need to occur in gutta sense prairie dogs. Again, we have less than 300 in the wild today. At its peak, we had about 1,000 acres, but um, plague came through and basically stalled at the western edge of South Dakota for a long, long time. And then in 2008, it jumped this invisible plague line and annihilated Kanata Basin um, and the Badlands National Park population, which used to be 30,000 acres of prairie dogs with over 300 ferrets. Ferrets are territorial, so they need like at least 100 to 150 acres of prairie dogs per family group. So it requires some substantial acreage to keep ferrets alive. So we're, we're not looking too good right now, but um, we're still hopeful. All of this is led by the, Black, the Blackfoot Ferret Recovery and Implementation Team implemented by the Fish and Wildlife Service. And there are over 30 state, federal, tribal, nonprofit, private zoo associations that are helping to achieve recovery. It's a pretty amazing partnership that's pretty cohesive. So what are we doing to keep these guys alive? How are we getting them back on the ground? I talked earlier about captive breeding. That's really the, the foundation for what we have today. All ferrets that are released into the wild come out of this captive breeding stock. There are several zoos and a breeding facility in um, Colorado in which they come from. This is a science in and of itself that I'm not gonna get into today, but it's a pretty amazing um, effort. Um, Preconditioning. So once ferrets are old enough, we put them in a prairie dog boot camp. They have to learn to go from captivity where they're hand-fed prairie dogs to learning how to be successful at killing prairie dogs themselves. So they go into these um, pens that are built over prairie dog burrows and they have to successfully kill at least one prairie dog before we release them into the wild. If they don't kill a prairie dog, they're done. They're, they go back into like an educational facility or something else. So, you know, you gotta survive out there. Otherwise, we're just releasing animals to uh, coyote bait later on. Uh, reintroductions, again, really successful situation for us. Um, without these, we couldn't really launch this effort, but not all sites are created equal. There are very few sites out there of that 30,000 acre quality. You probably have all learned about self-sustaining populations at a certain time in your career here at South Dakota State. Those need to be 
um, at least for ferrets, if you're going to have at least 100 breeding adults, you need at least 10,000 acres. There are very few areas in the United States today that have 10,000 acres or more of connected prairie dog colonies in which these guys <coughs> thrive. So we have put prairie, prairie, ferrets have been released into prairie dog complexes of 1,500 acres, 3,000 acres, 5,000 acres, but the bigger the complex, the better they do. So we're hoping to keep growing. Um, a really key tool for us has been the ability to release ferrets as a non-essential experimental population. As an endangered species that comes with a lot of rules and red tape, particularly for private and tribal landowners um, who might be willing to host the species. So there are things like 10A1As and 10Js, which are just the regulatory framework in which we're allowed to put these endangered species on the ground. So there's, if there's incidental take, no landowner is held responsible. There's a really great program that was recently developed called the Safe Harbor Agreement, where it allows landowners interested in hosting ferrets to create a conservation zone, create a buffer zone around it, so if ferrets escape or move into the prey dog colonies outside of that conservation zone, they can be tracked back, they don't have to change their operations, and prey dogs can be controlled around the outside of that conservation zone if their neighbors are not excited about it. So some really good framework in place, which really allows us to move things forward. And that's allowed us also to work with the Natural Resources Conservation Service to create these voluntary landowner incentives to encourage landowners to host prairie dogs and ferrets. All of you know that there's some controversy probably surrounding prairie dogs and, and ranching. And this provides a little bit of help to ranchers for any kind of foregone forage that might occur with the presence of prairie dogs. So it's been a really great tool for us to have some of that around. Um, we've implemented five new reintroduction sites in Colorado alone just by providing landowners with a per acre payment to host ferrets and prairie dogs. It's a pretty awesome program. Unfortunately, it's grossly underfunded. Plague mitigation is a really huge strategy for us. So thankfully, there is a plague vaccine available for ferrets. That's pretty easy. We only have. 300 ferrets in the wild. We have about 280 ferrets in captivity, and all ferrets that are born into the captivity prior to release in the wild are vaccinated against canine distemper and sylvatic plague. And then annually, in the wild, we track up kits to provide them with that sylvatic plague canine distemper. Um, a booster shot's really helpful. Um, that's another feat in and of itself, tracking kits at night, but it's super fun. If you ever want to do it, call me and I'll set you up. <laughs> we'll go out and spotlight for hours at night. Um, and then the other way we are mitigating plague currently is through a dust insecticide that we spray into prairie dog burrows to suppress flea populations which carry plague. Um, this is a hugely labor intensive situation, uh, hugely costly, not that fun, but it's highly effective. Um, and we're doing some research against looking at the um, potential resistance of fleas to plague dust, this dust that we're using, um, that's a whole other story too. Um, plague research is a really key strategy for us, advancing our understanding of, you know, basic plague ecology, how it spread, how does it, you know, where does it go after it comes through and wipes out an entire prairie dog colony, what happens to it? Does it hang out in the soil? Is it carried by rodent hosts? What's going on? We don't really know. But one really cool thing that came out of this is a plague vaccine for prairie dogs. And I'll talk about that a little bit later. But plague research is in the forefront of what we think about and do pretty much every day. Um, current challenges to blackfooted ferret recovery are numerous. Plague, sylvatic plague, is the same black plague that killed millions of people in Europe. You know, it's pneumonic, it's septicemic, it's everything, and all, and it's just it's a horrible disease, and it's non-native, so there's no little there's little natural immunity for a lot of species. Um, it's our single largest hurdle, and um, if we can mitigate plague, we can recover ferrets. Uh, the other thing is we need enough suitable release sites of sufficient size for ferret recovery. So white-tailed prairie dogs, their social structure is such that their burrows are farther apart, so we need at least 3,000 acres of white tails in order to consider um, a blackfoot ferret release. Black-tailed prairie dogs will take 1,500 acres, but really we'd love to see those acreages closer to 5,000 acres, 10,000 acres, 20,000 acres. There's only three sites in the world today, in North America today, 
Aubrey Valley, Arizona, Kanata Basin, South Dakota, and Thunder Basin National Grassland where there's sufficiently sized sites for fair. <coughs> Thunder Basin doesn't have prairie dogs for political reasons. I'll talk about that a little bit later, but um, it really makes a difference. There are exceptions, so I don't know if any of you have been to Lower Rule right here on the, um, the border of the Missouri River, but high density prey dog colonies um, prior to plague outbreak there. And there are only like 3,000 acres of prey dogs and like 60 ferrets hanging out. So high prey dog densities can really help um, offset some of the acreage requirements, <coughs> but it's pretty rare. And South Dakota is really the only place you find some of those high densities. Um, another big challenge for us is funding. The federal funding that comes through the pipe is really streamlined to the captive breeding efforts. And there's really little money available for release sites that are hosted by willing partners, whether it's federal or private or tribal. Um, that The onus is on those partners to pay for monitoring, pay for plague mitigation. So I spent a lot of time writing grants and helping to raise funding to get those sites up and going and then to be maintained, and it's not cheap. Um, so that's a lot of um, the trouble that we have. I spent a lot of time lobbying for congressional funding in D.C. And no one really cares about ferrets, but you know it's interesting. We spend $400 million a year to prevent the listing of sage grouse. No offense, Lindsay. Um, but uh, less than a million uh, dollars a year are, is devoted to recovering endangered species. So just to put that in perspective. Politics play a big role in that. Nobody likes prairie dogs, except for people working in the prairie dog field, um, or people that live in cities that don't live with prairie dogs. But they are the chicken McNuggets of the prairie. They do maintain grasslands and grassland ecosystem health. And the only places prairie dogs live today, um, I shouldn't say the only place. There are a lot of places prairie dogs live. But in, in the face of plague, a lot of the, what's left is what we're protecting for ferrets. Um, and there's just a lot of social and political aspects here that need to be addressed, and that's a big hurdle for us. Like I was saying earlier, there are 20,000 acres of black-tailed prey dogs in Thunder Basin National Grassland in Wyoming, and not a ferret, has, a ferret hasn't touched foot on there because of the, the contention between the landowners leasing the grazing lands there, the federal government, and the Game and Fish Agency. So there's a lot of creativity that needs to come in with finding peace and, and positivity surrounding how can we help landowners um, tolerate ferrets and prairie dogs and is that an incentive based program is that something else so we're still trying to figure a lot of that out it's not all doom and gloom we've had some really great successes captive breeding preconditioning has all worked it's really increased our ability to increase survival of ferrets you know for rescuing the species for one but also survival once we put them out on the ground you know, a lot of captive bred animals, that was a great example in the swift fox world where captive animals were released um, into Canada and they quickly died, you know, and so wild born animals are best, um, but if you can simulate that preconditioning, it really helps. Introductions have been really great. This newly developed sylvatic plague vaccine I'm gonna talk about next um, has been kind of this really exciting technology for us that's allowing us to move forward with having another tool in our toolbox to mitigate plague for prairie dogs. You can't go out there and uh, vaccinate every prairie dog, so how can you create herd immunity? Uh, these safe harbor agreements with regulatory assurances that allow us to put ferrets out on the ground without consequence to landowners has been huge. Incentives, again, another really um, great tool in order to move forward, and partnerships are key. There is not a single reintroduction site out there that isn't done with a group of people working toward the same goal. And that has really blended um, all sorts of user groups, you know, whether you're talking about recreational shooting, whether you're talking about ranching, whether you're talking about, you know, environmental lovers, it's all been a really fantastic um, group of people, biologists, researchers, management agencies alike that are really moving this um, recovery effort forward. So I'm gonna highlight a few projects that are super fun. These tiny little blueberry looking things are the sylvatic plague vaccine baits for prairie dogs. We dive in blue so we can see them on the ground. There was some really great early laboratory testing to find out would prairie dogs eat baits, what flavor, what size, what texture, you know, what holds this vaccine bait for sylvatic plague protection best. 
Turns out peanut butter was the winning flavor. Um, it used to be made in cookie sheets in a lab in Wisconsin by our partners with the US Geological Survey, but now we make it in these round baits, which has been a really fun story in and of itself. There's this guy in Lithuania named Eddie. He makes these carp, baits for carp, and these little boily roller machines. And so we bought these boily roller machines from Lithuania to help us make these guys round so that we can distribute them at scale. So um, in the early days, we had four years of field trials um, where we had 50 to 100 acre plots where these baits were put out on transects and bait uptake rates and um, survivability and a whole suite of metrics were measured to make sure it was effective in the lab, is it effective in the wild, what does that look like, <coughs> timing of it, placement of it, etc. Again, not every prairie dog is going to be vaccinated, but the gist is herd immunity. So it's worked out really, really well. The issue has been, now that the field trials are over, and it's seemingly a promising um, tool for us to mitigate plague, how do you get that out on the ground at scale? If we're talking about covering 1,500 acres or 10,000 acres, how are you going to distribute these little guys? You just broadcast them out the back of a truck? Or, you know, if you're out here walking hand, hand by hand by hand, you know, dropping these guys can take forever. People are getting sunburned and grumpy. So um, we partnered with several folks to distribute vaccines by uh, unmanned aircraft systems, or we just call it drone drugging. So uh, <laughs> this has been a super fun project with the Fish and Wildlife Service and model avionics, USGS, and a suite of others. And we developed these, um, this really cool delivery hoppers, this little red um, box that you see attached to the bottom of the multi-rotor here. That's where all the baits go into. Um, so we developed, this is a single shooter, so it drops one bait at a time at a predetermined waypoint location, transects across um, prey dog colonies. It's great, you can use this, you know, open source software to load the waypoints into it and it tells the drone where to drop the base. It's pretty slick. We also developed a triple shooter for an ATV. So it drops one bait down at a time, uh, one or three baits simultaneously, one bait down to the in front and two out to the side and you cover a lot of acres really quickly and it's super exciting. It's really fun and people are blasting out there on ATVs, shooting these little blueberries around. Um, and it's been super, super fun, and it's a great way for us to get this out. We had uh, some field trials last summer on the Charles and Russell National Wildlife Refuge in Montana. Uh, we covered about 2,000 acres um, through ATV, triple shooters, and a couple hundred acres using this multi-rotor. We had a couple of jamming issues. The baits get soft. They're not perfectly round, so we're troubleshooting some of that. I'm going to show you a little video here. That's what it looks like dropping out of the multi-rotor. We call this ship after the dog we found the last ferret. Here's a little video that I'll play for you guys to see kind of the process. Black-footed ferrets are thought to be extinct two different times and have been on the endangered species act for a long time and a lot of people are working to recover. Ferrets are an obligate predator in prairie dogs. That's the only place they can live and survive is on prairie dog colonies. Probably one of the biggest obstacles to ferret recovery is plague because it's highly lethal to both prairie dogs and ferrets and it can wipe out thousands of acres of prairie dogs in just a few weeks. If we don't protect their prey base, the prairie dogs, uh, they would have nothing to eat anyway. Uh, so it's important for us to find a way to manage plague in prairie dogs as well as ferrets. So we developed the vaccine first. And then we started looking for baits that we could deliver it to prairie dogs. And we put peanut butter into it as an attractant for the prairie dogs, as well as mix the vaccine right in. It takes maybe more than 10,000 acres of prairie dogs to support what might be a viable ferret population. And the objectives under World Wildlife Fund and all the partners that we work with is to remove the black-footed ferret from the endangered species list. But if we're going to start treating thousands of acres, we have to find a distribution system. And our best idea so far is a unit that will distribute from ATVs, sort of a hopper that will drop one pellet straight down and then shoot one to the left and shoot one to the right 30 feet simultaneously. And I've been able to treat about 50 acres per hour on an ATV. He doesn't usually drive that 
the other idea came up with using unmanned aerial systems. There's a lot of places I imagine that are going to be not ATV accessible. That's where this little guy is really going to show its true worth. So we load the correct amount of um, pellets. Uh, we'll put the hopper on. We'll we go ahead and click in the autonomous mode, and then it takes off and does its uh, mission. We're about 60 feet up, flying at about 20 miles per hour. So you can watch it go down that transect line on the computer so we get to see exactly what's going on. So uh, every one second it will drop a pellet. Right, so they eat the baits and that immunizes them against the disease. This project has involved so many collaborators, the molecular biologists that created the vaccine in the first place, all the field partners that have helped us. I think it's something like 30 different agencies involved in this project. We've talked a long time about how we would deliver millions of baits to prairie ducks. And so it's been great to see these people get together and really figure out how we can do it. This project fits well with the mission of World Wildlife Fund to use the best available science to achieve our conservation objectives and to bring back the endangered black root ferret. So it's pretty fun. Um, next steps for us are to build a triple shooter for the unmanned aircraft system. And we're hoping to actually attach it to a helicopter that's bigger and faster, carries more bait so we can cover lots of ground really quickly. So next summer we've got four sites that we're hoping to test it on. We're also going to uh, improve our triple shooter system for the ATV. We've got high demand for it already. So it's super fun and super exciting. <coughs> a great way to use innovative technology to advance our conservation objectives. Um, Um, another challenge that we have, it's not a challenge, but it's just labor intensive as you probably all know doing field work, that um, mapping habitat for black-footed ferrets is really labor intensive. Um, and it's really fun, um, but it's also labor intensive. So the two metrics that we typically acquire are prey dog density, and this is to assess site suitability for ferret reintroductions, and then also to assess what's going on with ferret habitat as we begin reintroductions and as reintroductions take hold. So for prey dog density, there are visual counts you can conduct or you can do line um, strip transects, estimating the number of active and inactive burrows and applying this cool little formula to, uh, to get an estimate of prey dog density. The other metric we use is um, prey dog colony size, just by taking a, a Trimble unit or a GPS unit and mapping the outermost active perimeter of each prairie dog colony that gives us the estimated size. So those two things are fantastic, but they do take a long time. So we were wondering if we, again, could use unmanned aerial systems to collect this data more efficiently um, and ideally more cost effectively. Again, one of the issues is funding, and a lot of our tribal partners don't have the ability to pay for a lot of labor. So can we you know, buy a cheap drone, and fly around and collect the data that we need to with one person? Or do we need still this fleet of people to help us out? You know, the jury's still out on that, but it was super fun. So we um, partnered with Topcon, and we they loaned us this super, super fancy $60,000 fixed wing aircraft to help us, um, well, actually in a little video, but to map prey dog colonies. Basically, we, um, I have a Blackford Ferret Recovery Project at Fort Bill Neck Indian Reservation in Montana. And so we had predetermined flight lines and segments that we flew, just like we did before with the multi-rotor um, transects. And it's just instead of dropping a bait, it's collecting images over time. And then you ortho mosaic those images together to, uh, to be able to estimate prey dog colony size and density from those images. So here's a little video talking about this particular work. And they're just two minute video here. Grasslands of the Great Plains are one of the most imperiled ecosystems in the world. This place is teeming with wildlife, from mountain plovers to burrowing owls to prairie dogs. It's alive. Black Friday Fair, or the mass bandit of the prairie, as we like to refer to it, are a highly elusive nocturnal species. You can't see them during the day, you have to go out at night. And there are fewer than 300 individuals in the wild today. The primary prey item for the black bear ferret are prairie dogs. It's really important that the areas where ferrets are reintroduced have the capacity to support large numbers of ferrets. 
Because surveying for prairie dog colony size and density takes so long on foot and by ATV, we are testing the application of unmanned aerial systems to assess whether we can speed that process up. We recruited experts from many fields. Bayron LLC and Idaho State University, TopCon, and the Fort Belknap Fish and Wildlife Department. This is giving them an exact 3D representation of what's on the ground. So it, it's going to fly 65 miles an hour. We can collect somewhere in the neighborhood between 30 and 40 million points in a 40 minute flight. That would take somebody on the ground infinitely longer to capture that same collection. Those images will get stitched together and we'll be able to assess prey on colony size and density from those images. So if the application of unmanned aerial systems to monitor blackfoot ferret habitat is successful and efficient, we're hoping we can replicate that at other sites. You know, with the World Wildlife Fund, they're providing the expertise and, you know, the technology like this here. This is an experimental technology, but, you know, I think it's going to be some, some positive results that come out of it. And it's all, all about conservation. You know. We're really excited to part of it uh, because I do think that this is the world's first groundbreaking type of application and there'll be a lot more in the future. And we couldn't be more thrilled to be here contributing to that historical moment in time and to complete that picture of prairie ecosystem as a whole that restores what was once here 100 years ago and to remove the black footed ferret from the endangered species list. This isn't a shameless World Wildlife Fund promotional. It's just a nice little um, picture of what the project's about. But once we get the data, um, we did pull it all together. This has been really fun. We've got a paper coming out about it. So we did do um, some ground comparisons. So in 27 plots, we collected borough estimates. Um, and then from the computer, we created an algorithm to identify what a borough was. And then the computer counted burrows within each plot. And um, as, so just for reference, these little, um, the, the red dots are burrow openings for prairie dogs. This is a person walking one of the plots right now. And all these little paths you see here are just the prairie dog superhighways between burrows. Um, so it's been a super fun project. We had to tell the computer what to look for in burrow. You know, we had some shadow issues in terms of prairie dogs standing in the top of a burrow making it look like a burrow opening, but not really, or rock. So it was a pretty cool process to develop this um, algorithm. But once we had the, the ground truth plots, we had the computer generated counts, um, and then we also visually counted the imagery. Um, we got all those things, and amazingly, um, it's pretty comparable. Um, but then from there, you can also just get colony size. The great part about having images versus just um, shape file data is that you can compare changes in colony distribution and size and vegetation over time. Um, interestingly enough too, here um, we saw a lot of, um, uh, when we were spotlighting for ferrets, we're constantly transecting the colony, so these are truck tracks that then can lead to the invasion of non-native grasses and forbs, so it's good. It's great to have the images over time. The biggest issue really is stitching them all together. It takes a lot of computer power. It takes a lot of time. That technology, you can ship out to drone, drone deploy or other companies, but it's not cheap, it's not easy yet. But it's exciting to try this technology to help advance conservation. Um, we put together the super fun little arc map, uh, online mapping system through Esri. Um, it's a story map that tells a story. It's a great way to just kind of highlight your project. So if any of you guys have fun projects and are working with Esri, talk to them about story maps. It's a fun way to do it. Um, so looking forward with ferret recovery, um, we, do I have, okay, I guess I'm just gonna talk for a couple minutes. I'm almost done here, wrap it up. Um, we're really excited about the application of this Slovatic plague vaccine to help us really move the needle forward in, in ferret recovery. Plague management is our single largest hurdle. Um, so that's pretty promising, but we can't stop there. It takes about three years to build that herd immunity. We're still needing a place to build, to uh, create more <laughs> carp making machines to make more bait. So we're working with wildlife services to, and that they'll hopefully host that facility um, and be able to help us um, really make a million baits a year or more so we can put them out on the landscape. Um, 
really the, again, the application of new technologies. I'm actually going to be testing this forward-looking infrared camera system to help us detect ferrets at night. So Google technologies, camera technologies, we use these camera technologies to detect poachers in Africa. So it's fun to be able to transfer some of this technology here to the Great Plains. You guys should be thinking about some of that for your own work here on the prairie. Um, again, fundraising is a big part of what we do and how we need to achieve recovery. It's, um, it's just always a guessing game about where your next uh, cash is going to come from. National Fish and Wildlife Foundation, if you guys don't know about it, they have a really great, uh, they have an awesome Northern Great Plains initiative. They do a lot of proposals every fall. Um, you can secure $200,000 over three years, so if you're looking for funding, that's a great source for you. Um, and then really just celebrating partnerships and ferret recovery and looking forward to next tools, tracking tools, any kind of fun tools um, to help us understand more about ferrets, where they are, what they're doing, and how they're surviving. So that's all I have today. Thanks so much for listening. Um, it's not this great pretty every time you go out and look for ferrets, but it is pretty cool. One night I was out tracking ferrets and uh, the Northern Lights came out and danced around. It was pretty awesome. It's a highly rewarding career for me. Even though the challenges are daunting, it's, a, it's pretty special to be involved with the recovery of invader species here in North America. Thanks for your time and energy. With that, I'll take any questions. seen a wild black foot ferret. I'll just tell you a little story. It was 1972, in June of 72. Uh, I was driving out to Custer State Park for an interview for a job as a conservation officer. And I'm in Millette County, and I look to my left and I can see the White River. The White River breaks. Yeah. And uh, I don't think there was an interstate then. I think it was on old Highway 34 or something. I look out my driver's side window, there's a black footed ferret standing on the edge of the road. Get out. That's awesome. <laughs> now, Lett, Lett County, most of the ferrets back in that day at the time was on the Adrian Ranch. Oh. It's a relative of my wife. Awesome. So, Bob Adrian was one of the guys' names. So, so that's, I just was wondering now, and then about four or five years ago, I was out in Wyoming hunting elk west of Matitsi. Yep. So I drive right by the Pitchfork Ranch. Yes, that's exactly where. And that's yeah. where they're doing reintroductions right now. Yeah, after 35 years. Yeah, we put ferrets back out there last summer. So it's just, just a, unbelievable when you see that. So I, I know I saw one black one. That's really, really exciting. Yeah, they do disperse. So, so are there any any black footed ferrets left in Millet County? Because that was ground zero for. It was ground for, zero. Uh, it was ground zero. Back in the, day. the only ferrets that we know of in that area. Um, at Badlands National Park and Buffalo Gap National Grassland. Um, and then elsewhere in South Dakota Cheyenne River um, Reservation, Lower Rule, Sioux Tribe, Wind Cave National Park. So those are the only populations in South Dakota currently. Um, but yeah, that was the stronghold, and that's where kind of the basis for all of what we started to know about ferrets came about. It's pretty exciting. It's really exciting that you've been there. Yeah. Cool. Fun. Thanks for sharing that. Anybody else have stories about their fair experience? Yeah. I can be his story. <laughs> <laughs> Go for it. Uh, 1965, I think, I was out West River, and a fellow, I think, by the name of Henderson, who worked for Game Fish and Jim. Parks, yeah. uh, we ran into each other. I was just starting college. And he said, uh, we've just discovered black-footed ferrets. I think he said that. He said, you want to go out and see one? So we went out at night with course what you have to do spotlighted we didn't see any at all but I always remember that time just after the discovery uh, that they were not extinct yeah. in fact and they were in South Dakota so that's super exciting yeah. I mean those were legendary days um, one of my former bosses talked about just being out there for days and days and nights and nights on end just hoping to find it I mean they were watching a species go extinct in front of their eyes and I'm not sure too many of us can say that now but I really hope we, we don't ever have to. So it was an exciting and sad time, but it's also a remarkable comeback story, you know, that we've been able to use innovation in terms of even capital breeding and reintroductions to like tracking technologies to, to bring this species back. So it's great that you guys have a little bit of experience with those early days. It's been fun. 
<coughs> what about you? You had fair, you saw ferrets too. Yeah, yeah. Um, Badlands National Park, that's what I thought. Yes, Josh. Um, so given that your the all of the ferrets come from, did you say seven founders yeah, seven at this founders. point? Yeah. Are you seeing any genetic anomalies? Are you seeing problems associated with such limited genetic material? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, surprisingly little. Okay. There's definitely been bottlenecks. A lot of it's been like sperm viability. Um, really <coughs> Santemeyer and Lincoln Park Zoo is doing a lot of that work. Um, some of what we're seeing are um, fluctuations in the number of kits produced, and we're trying to figure out why. And we think that you know that might have something to do with like just that the washing of gene pool over the years. Um, yeah, I mean sometimes it was like a crooked tail, or sometimes it was a crooked tail and a sperm, and sometimes it led to infertility. But very very few major major issues, which is remarkable. Um, and they are actually talking about uh, if anyone's heard from about revive and restore. But they are this kind of like proponents for bringing woolly mammoths back. <laughs> um, but they have some pretty empowering technologies to look at genetic manipulation. So they're actually looking at genetic manipulation of um, the gene in ferrets, which could turn on and off their susceptibility to plague. Um, so pretty amazing stuff there. Um, and also bringing back frozen semen from perished ferrets to kind of boost the, um, that genetic robustness back? That's a great question. Yes? On that, kind of on that topic, you know, you keep mentioning the stops and burger very often. Does that be ever turn loose of ferret out in the Chelsea Times World Colony in California? That's a really, really great question. Um, they're not native to California, but there are. they do overlap. The northernmost extent of black-footed ferrets is in Saskatchewan, Canada. Has anyone been to Grasslands National Park up there? Cool place. That's um, where ferrets and Richardson's, or uh, black-tailed prairie dogs and Richardson's ground squirrels overlap, and they will prey on Richardson's as well. Um, the burrows for Richardson's are smaller than prairie dogs, so for them to survive solely on them, we don't think that that could work in California simply because the burrow dynamics are so different that the shelter availability might really change. And ferrets are super susceptible to um, owl predators, badgers, coyotes. Well, badgers and major not so much, but certainly coyotes and raptors. There's, there's not a lot of plague in California, but there's also a lot of tularemia. Have you seen any tularemia impact here in the Great Plains? Yes, we are actually seeing a lot of tularemia come through, and ferrets are definitely susceptible to it. Um, you know, rabbits care are carrying it, and there's a lot of rabbits dying in ferret reintroduction sites. Um, and we do think that, uh, at least in Kanata Basin, South Dakota, we know that tularemia is present in prey dogs, but it so far hasn't really led to the demise of ferrets, which is pretty amazing. But really, really great observation on your part. Thank you. So we do have a question from uh, Jamie in West River. So Jamie asks, uh, well, it is certain that prairie dog colonization was reduced due to control efforts. Do you think it is unlikely that all of the Great Plains were colonized by prairie dogs as shown in your pre-settlement map given the wide variety of plant community soils and topography across the area? Yes, um, that's definitely a great question. That was certainly a, uh, you know, just a, that data does exist that prairie dog colonies used to be 20 miles long, 10 miles wide, and were distributed like you saw in the maps. Um, they weren't distributed that evenly. <laughs> we do have more accurate maps. Um, but soils do limit where fer ferrets and prairie dogs can live, topography, um, but it's amazing where prairie dogs do exist. Um, and it's not just control efforts that limited um, where prairie dogs were. Let's, let me just re read your question. Yeah, I mean, not every corner of the Great Plains was colonized. There's probably 550 million acres of Great Plains, gra you know, intermountain and prairie grasslands and probably only 100 million of those were occupied by prairie dogs. I hope that answers your question. Yes? I wondered about the vaccine. How, how long is it viable in the environment when you disperse it, and then how frequently you're thinking you might have to retreat in that's the a area? Good, yeah, that's a great question. Right now, um, it's 
It does better in colder temperatures. So if we keep it frozen, put it out early in the morning before the heat of the day, that's better. Fall is better. Uptake rates are better in the fall. We have to apply it annually. Um, even the dust insecticide we have to apply annually. The only vaccine that's viable for life is the F1B black, uh, select clay vaccine for ferrets. Once we give them that shot and a booster shot, they're good for life. But their kits aren't, doesn't get transferred down. So the prairie dog vaccine is definitely only um, viable in their system for up to a year. And again, even then, we're, we're seeing that by year three, that's when the, the max protection takes place. But we're not really sure it's still so early in the day. Like, how long can we start skipping years, or does it have to be an annual application once they get that three year immunity boost? But certainly, the lifespan of it, if it's frozen, it's good. And we are experimenting with like how long it can be out on the prairie before they eat it. We like to put it out early, early in the morning for heat wise, and then also to reduce the number of um, small mammals eating it over a period of Yes? What's your cost per acre? both vaccinate and treat uh, that That's a great question. Yeah, $26 an acre for dust insecticide, um, and that's usually pretty cheap labor. Um, the dust is about $200 a case, um, half a pound per acre. Vaccine is running 50 cents a bait right now, so that can be anywhere from 25 to $30 an acre, so it's not cheaper yet, but we're really hoping that we can bring that cost down. Right now, it's um, the Center for Veterinary Biologics in Colorado Serum are the ones that make it. Food Source Lures makes the matrix. And um, so they've got the, they kind of have us um, by their numbers. So what we're doing now, um, Colorado Parks and Wildlife um, biologists and researchers are testing the dosage rates per vaccine to help us bring down the cost. Because right now, it's only been tested at a certain dosage rate. like. This dose we know protects prairie dogs from plague, but can we bring that down and still have it be effective and then subsequently lower the cost for bait? So it's not cheap. And what was your ideal acreage size? Well, it depends. You know, if we are to recover ferrets, we, the larger the prairie dog complex is, 10,000 acres or more, the better. But that doesn't mean that the smaller 1,500 acre complexes don't work. Um, and really, a lot of it is about the distribution of them throughout so that metapopulation dynamic can work. But that's a perfect world, but we are only asking for one tenth of one percent of the historical acres to restore the species. So I know that a lot of perception is that prairie dogs are everywhere, and we're, we're asking for ferrets for everywhere. But when you boil it down, it's less than five hundred thousand acres. I'm curious, what is the either the empirical or the theoretical um, herd immunity threshold in prairie dog populations? Wow, good question for the Sylvatic Plague vaccine. Yeah, um, well we know, I don't, have a, I don't have a precise answer for that. You have to talk to Tony Rohde with USGS. Um, the field trial data shows currently that if you are vaccinating 50 baits per acre and you have 50 acres or 100 acres, that that's enough. Um, to protect the animals in that area. And, you know, prey dogs are anywhere from 10 to 30 dogs per acre. So that seems to be enough currently. I know that's not the like best answer, but that's what I know. And so now we're trying to scale that up. Can, can we use that same formula, 40, 50 base per acre, over 1,500 acres, over 10,000 acres, and is that enough? So far, we <coughs> said yes. But that's another thing that we need to figure out. And this is all, again, the vaccine is on a trial basis and not registered yet. Yes. Are there any plans uh, to move the, prairie, uh, the ferrets between human-assisted movement uh, in order to decrease uh, inbreeding? Yeah, great question. Um, it's happening only within release sites. So the two release sites that I know of that have moved ferrets around uh, are here in South Dakota, Lower Rural Reservation. He had plague come through that site, and so he helped um, move the ferrets to where prairie dogs were still living and where they had dusted. Um, and then Cheyenne River um, Reservation in northern South Dakota, um, they don't manage plague, and they just trap up and move their ferrets around to where prairie dogs are living currently. So um, we have enough ferrets in the captive breeding facility that we can augment populations as needed. Some of the best survival that we've had, though, at the height of ferret population 
history. Uh, basically, 2007 was at Kanata Base in South Dakota when we had wild born kits being released elsewhere. That's the perfect scenario. We're hoping to get back to that point, but we definitely need, in order for that to happen, we need like 20 to 30,000 acre complexes where ferrets are threatened. Thanks so much, you guys. I really appreciate your interest. Thanks, everyone.